There's two, so everybody, thanks for joining us. This is Tech Field Day 2016 here at Cisco Live. Um, we're gonna be focusing the demo today on Veeam Cloud Connect backup as a service as well as disaster recovery as a service, okay? And with that, there's two different personas that we're gonna talk about. The first one that we're gonna focus on is the service provider persona, right? And then the second persona is going to be the tenant. What is the tenant experience gonna look like, right? So what I'm logged into here is my Veeam backup and replication console. This is a virtual machine that I have deployed in my VMware environment. And you can see here along the top and the bottom, right, I'm focused on the Cloud Connect aspect, right? So this service provider is offering both backup as a service as well as disaster recovery as a service. And one of the first things that they're going to want to do to get up and running to offer these services, they're going to need to set up just a, ba a few basic Veeam components but they also need to make sure that they have an entire hypervisor environment. They need to make sure that they have the proper, you know, domain traffic, DNS uh, resolution. They need to make sure that they have, you know, the necessary physical switching layer in place as well. Um, so the way that we get this set up and running is the first thing that we're going to recognize here is the fact that we have this concept of proxy servers. So these are the data movers in the environment. The second area that we're going to focus on um, is repositories. All right. So the repository is my cloud-based. Um, backup storage, what I'm going to use as a target for my backup files, for my tenant, okay? And off of that, we're going to create um, cloud repositories, all right? And we're going to assign quotas and things to our tenant, and that's the way that they're going to target um, the service provider for backup as a service, right? So if I switch over here to the main Cloud Connect tab, the first area is the way that we offer multi-tenancy. So it's something that is extremely important from a service provider perspective. How do I segment my tenants' traffic from each other, right? And we do that using VLANs. We can all agree that VLANs are a common technology that's readily available in every single data center out there today. So in my VMware environment, I have my ESX hosts. Those ESX hosts have physical NICs that are attached to them that just so happen to get plugged into my network fabric, right? Those switches would need to have a set of VLANs configured that aren't routable between them. So the network extension appliance within the Veeam software is going to handle all of the routing of all that traffic. So those VLANs are configured at the physical layer, and then you can come here into the Veeam console and you can add those physical VLANs, right? Which VLANs do I want to have internet access to? Which VLANs do I want to be strictly dedicated for internal traffic, okay? The second area that a service provider needs to focus on is, you know, what if I have a customer that wants to fail, do an entire site failover to my data center, but they have some applications and services that they need to get to from the outside internet, right? So what they would do, and what Justin has done for us, is they carve up a small set of public IP addresses that they would have purchased, and we can come in here and we can manage those public IPs and I can assign those public IPs to an individual tenant. So this gentleman here, you know, customer X might have, you know, one public <laughs> IP address. You can call him Ethan. Right. <laughs> tenant, tenant number one sitting to the left of me. I'm sorry if I keep picking on you. It's very convenient. <laughs> We're friends now. Okay. <laughs> You're going to be my example over and over again. I feel so depersonalized. <laughs> Well, if Stephen would have given us name tags, I would know what your name is. Oh, I landed on, sorry. So you can come in here and you can see the public IP addresses and which tenants that they're allocated to. You can add them in very, very simply, right? Pretty straightforward things. It's all done natively through the user interface. Um, the next component here is getting a certificate. Um, definitely recommend going out to a public key, uh, a public certificate authority and getting a signed certificate. That way, you know, the, it's validated and you can import that in here um, once this comes up here in a second hopefully Got a little bit of latency here going over the interwebs um, and you can see here we can import our certificate in or we can use a self uh, excuse me a uh, uh, the certificate that comes with it if I was maybe doing this in a test dev environment or a proof of concept environment that's probably the best way to go the second component that we're gonna let's hit this there so we got a speedy internet connection, I see. Speedy. Yep. The second component is the cloud gateway, right? So as I mentioned before, we recommend at least three cloud gateways regardless of the size of the service provider. 
So the cloud gateway sits inside of the DMZ zone of the service provider environment, okay? So if we think about the way that, that traffic comes in, I have my WAN zone on the exterior. All my traffic comes in over port 6180 using DNS round robin. It gets loaded into one of these cloud gateway virtual servers, all right? They, ha they have their own internal load balancing so it knows which cloud gateway has is, you know, this much traffic going through it. Um, so it's intelligent to balance the load of all the tenants incoming traffic across the three of them. Um, and this is, this is a DR scenario. This is when I'm in my recovery mode. This is just getting the service provider set up. These are the multiple, the different components that a service provider needs to accept backup and disaster. This is the infrastructure so I can start pushing data up into the cloud. Correct. The yep. This yeah. is what Justin has gone through in his environment to get up and running. <laughs> yeah. But if I had my own data center that I wanted to push it to, could I deploy those in my data center? Or is this something only for your service providers? No, so a service provider, kind of the, if I had a secondary site, chances are I've got an MPLS connection to them, right? Which completely eliminates the need of using this type of technology because I've sure. got a dedicated wire, a dedicated pipe, and I would just deploy um, proxy server repositories in there like I would on-prem. Yeah. I wouldn't have to stand up Cloud Gateway because the Cloud Gateway essentially is acting as a firewall, right? Right. Because it's public facing, it has two network interfaces on it. One is my public IP address and the second one is internal traffic to get routed through. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, that, and that's one of the reasons for you know, kind of the design considerations for, for both backup as a service and DR as a service is, as you said, we need a way for customers to be able to get data to a service provider without having to manage all those VPNs. Right. And then and during the failover, which we'll kind of go into, that's where a lot of this networking and, and, and some of this other stuff come in, which you wouldn't need, you know, if you had. But could any service provider deploy that if they wanted to? Like, can they contact you and say, I want to. Yeah, anybody could, yep. any service provider could sign up to be a Veeam Cloud service provider. Okay. Yeah, as part of the program. Yeah, so that was actually where I was going. Oh, sorry, yeah. So, yeah, so if I'm a service provider, <coughs> I can go out and say, you know, I want to offer this service to Veeam mm -hmm. customers. and. Cool. Yeah, and that's all licensed based on a, a rental agreement um, that they can purchase on an annual basis, and there's an entire point system that goes along with that. Hmm. Okay. And they report yeah. back their usage on a monthly basis that says, you know, I have X amount of virtual machines that I'm yeah, protecting. Yeah, it's yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Do you have any requirements of those providers, like power infrastructure, network infrastructure? Can anybody just sign up to be a, you know? Anybody, technically anybody can sign up to be a Veeam Cloud and Service Provider. However, we do have a validation process for our elite service providers like iLand, and we have a couple of other ones as well that have gone through kind of the, the tests to validate that they're set up appropriately. Anything that you want to add around that? Sure, I mean, um, just going back to your original question, uh, primarily when customers have uh, one administrative domain, so say you weren't going to deal with a, a provider, and maybe you had a site that was connected with VPN or MPLS, maybe you have a vCenter in site A and vCenter in site B, Back to what Clint said, I mean, that since that's under your admin domain, you have access to access vCenters at both sides, uh, this is really would not be needed for that type of environment. What that helps us as a provider, um, or Veeam Cloud Connect helps us as a provider, is we obviously can't give you administrative rights to vCenter, I can't give right. you administrative rights to a shared infrastructure. Right. So that's where that multi-tenancy comes out. And then to answer your question, yes, I mean, when we signed up to do this early on, we had to work with Veeam and Veeam Engineering to set up test accounts. So, uh, I'm sure Clint will show you the, the backup piece as well as the failover piece, right. but there's an audit process that happens. They make sure you have things like the proper SSL, they make sure VPNs, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, failovers work, the stress load testing works and so forth. So it, it definitely was a, uh, a checklist that we had to go, with, go through with Veeam Engineering to be vetted as the type of provider. Yeah. But, the, but the idea of you know, what you said earlier about anyone can sign up to be a service provider, it is in a sense true. Um, you know, there's, there's a process we, like we mentioned. But part of the reason for that is when you think about Veeam as a global company, we have customers all over the globe. And a lot of times, you know, depending on country rec rules and regulations and laws, um, you know, they like to go to someone local uh, versus, you know, going to someone in, you know, the United States um, in the Snowden era, as I like to call it. So, um, you know, it just, it just leaves the customers a lot more choice in terms of who they choose, you know, to, to trust with their data. And we don't necessarily tell anyone to go any one, any one particular provider. We have a list, you know, say, hey, go sign up, find one that, that, that meets your needs. Um, so, you know, it's just that, that idea of choice and each one can offer different, different services. I think what's also nice too is that just the locality. I mean, you, you, everybody knows in the room about latency and 
you know, distance between point A and point B and to Doug's yeah. point, having a global network of these providers, uh, obviously you, the, uh, provider A might have a feature that provider B doesn't have, but also they may be closer. Yeah. Um, so your backups just will back up faster. Well, as we, long as they're not too close, because of a disaster. A lot of, you know. <laughs> well, a lot of service providers too have private networks that they can offer. Mm -hmm. So they could offer you cloud gateway off-site right. you know, over their over Traditional. internal network. Yeah. I as infrastructure as a service, where so they can yeah. you know yeah. provision you up a, a pool of, of of resources and you can run your data center. Essentially, it was yours, only it's you know in their environment. Yeah. So the next area, right, we've kind of set up our cloud gateway, we've set up our IP addresses, all that stuff. Now I'm at the point where, you know, gentleman to my left who has still yet to give me his first name. I told you, it's Ethan. Ethan. <laughs> Ethan is going to be my, my tenant. Ethan says, you know what, Clint, I need backup as a service, I need some cloud repository space, and I also need some replica space as well, all right? So in here, I can designate him what we call a cloud repository. Now, Ethan needs you know, a terabyte worth of space for his backups. Um, I can also utilize what we call the WAN acceleration feature. right? So in our service provider environment, we've gone through and deployed the WAN accelerator as well. And this, again, runs on a Windows Server 2012 virtual machine in our infrastructure. The second part, Ethan says, Clint, I need to be able to fail over <laughs> to your data center, right? I want to run, I want to be able to have, you know, the best recovery time objectives possible, right? Backup, there's a slight penalty, right? I need to restore it back into the environment. DR replicas are sitting there ready, waiting to be powered on, okay? So what I have gone ahead and taken the liberty to do for Ethan, because I knew he was going to ask me about this, is create a hardware plan. This hardware plan has a set of CPU, and memory, aka this is, can also be known as a resource pool that we create within vCenter, right, specific for this tenant that has 10 gigahertz worth of compute power as well as 12 gig worth of memory, and it's got some storage allocated to it as well, okay? So he can fully have virtual machines ready to be either partially failed over or we can do a full site failover as well, right? And then we have the option of utilizing the network extension appliance, right? Now we do have service providers that do utilize their own routing and switching infrastructure with Justin can happily share information about that. Um, but what we're gonna leverage in our demo is the full usage of the network extension appliance, which is great for partial failovers, right? It moves a lot of the, the complexities of having to deal with the individual components um, as well. And when you look at storage in that resource pool, are you only looking at the amount of storage, or can you also define, you know, IOPS, et cetera, for... It's a traditional VMware data store. In our lab, it's a vSAN environment that we've created, but I could have, you know, offer different tiers to my customers. Maybe I have less performing storage. Maybe I have higher performing SSD storage. I can have a platinum offering where you're guaranteed, you know, this many IOPS and this much latency, or and I can have a different offering where, you know, maybe it's not my most mission critical apps and services, I can have a different offering that goes to a different, you know, slower tier of storage as well. So, so you, none, of that, none of that's defined here, that would be defined on your... Correct, right. right. And right. You would create a, you'd create a hardware plan for each one of those. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You so you'd have, you, you could have different levels of hardware plans, you could have like, you know, silver, gold, platinum, um, and, you know, each one might have you know, either faster storage or, or more CPU or you know, different, different types of things that you would define within those hardware plans. But within here on the storage side, it's just space on that particular data store that, that's defined as part of that plan. Gotcha. Anything to add? Anything special that yeah, iLand's doing? Sure. Like, as a provider, if you, if you know vCenter, uh, if you can imagine if you said, to Doug's point, if you had a gold plan and maybe a silver plan, maybe the gold plan landed on a higher capacity CPU or maybe an SSD array. So it'd be very easy for us to say, okay, hardware plan gold lands on this vCenter uh, cluster, it lands on this vCenter data store, data store cluster, and then maybe silver maps to a different one, being the underlying disks, maybe SSD or maybe 7200K disks, so, you know, something like that. So it's very easy to break that down and get very granular for customers. Gotcha. Yeah. But what the, I've, go I'm ahead. sorry, no, just no. the ease of use to you is that you just get a very simple cosmetic hardware plan that maybe say right. gold and silver yeah. and you contract with you know the way island does it you would contract us with contract with us as a provider to get the service level you, you paid for it's very simple Oops. wrong one 
can show you here. Fast flipping. There we go. All right, so just to really quickly to, to kind of edit the settings of this hardware plan, I can show you here that it's essentially, you know, just that, right? I can dedicate how much, it's based on a slider, right? How much CPU, how much memory that I want to allocate to that hardware plan. Uh, we recommend that each tenant get their own hardware plan. That way, you know, if I want to, if Ethan needs to make a change and says, hey, you know what, next week I need, you know, 128 gig worth of memory. I'm not affecting every tenant underneath there as well, right? So it's, it allows for a little bit more flexibility. So switching over to the, uh, oops, keep getting mixed up, <laughs> to the tenant view, right? So tenant has backup jobs. Backup jobs are running on-prem in their data center targeting, you know, a Veeam repository. Um, a great being here at Cisco Live 2016 in Vegas with you guys, one of the, the great repositories that we fully support and Justin runs in his data center today is the, the Cisco UCS 3160, 3260 storage servers. Um, essentially, it's a JBOD, it's a 4U storage appliance that you can pack full of as much disk as possibly can um, and use that as a, as a fantastic Veeam backup repository. Um, the other thing that we've got going on here is the concept of backup copy, right? So this is where I'm going to say I want all the virtual machines in this job or a subset of virtual machines to go out to a cloud-based repository. So you can see here that I've got a couple of different jobs. One has a set of four virtual machines, and since my uh, connection isn't necessarily the fastest, I won't drill into this, um, but I have four virtual machines configured in this backup copy job, and I can come down here to my cloud-based backup tab, and I can see these virtual machines and how many restore points that I've got out in the iLAN data center. Make sense, right? So, th I mean, this is basically the customer view. This is the customer view, absolutely, yeah. right? This is what, you know, Ethan logs into whenever he goes into his Veeam console um, to, to make sure that everything's, you know, running okay. Maybe you need to add a couple of new VMs, you know, edit some restore points, retention policy. So you can see here that I've got six different restore points as part of my demo environment going out to the, uh, to the, to the iLAN data center. And then I can also you know, do full VM recovery. I can do individual item level recovery from those backup restore points that are in my cloud-based repo. The second part of this being disaster recovery as a service and the concept of replication. So if I edit the settings of this job, So in our, you know, in our terms for replication, it's you know, essentially what's called host-based replication. You take a VM and you replicate it from one host to another. Um, in this case, the host just happens to be in the cloud. And you know, as, as the customer, once you go in and you add that cloud-based um, replication target, now it shows up as a target when you actually go in and create a new replication job, um, or if, you, if we ever get the dialog box up here for editing this. Yep. I, um, <laughs> fortunately enough for us, this guy does come prepared. So I was going to do a live demo for you guys, but I do have just to kind of seamless, make things a little bit more seamless for you here and so we can speed things up and give you the, the full gamut of everything that we've got going on here. Um, one of the things that I did forget to mention there in uh, my little pitch there is the, is the ability that we have to go out here and do service provider searches, right? So when in the, in the Veeam console, if I rewind here just a little bit. There we go. Service providers, you can do a service provider lookup. So if a customer didn't know, you know, which service providers do I have available for me, you can go out there. We have a link out to the veeam.com website where they can do a lookup if they're looking for somebody in North America or if they're looking for somebody in Europe that offers backup as a service or DR as a service, they have that option for them. Canada. Um, Anybody in Canada doing it? Yep. 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 Yeah, I don't know the, any off the top of my head, but I... Okay. You could look it up. You could look it up. <laughs> I, I would look it up, but... I'm not sure if you're any, uh, coming up to it, but kind of what's the workflow for when I have that disaster? Like, the DMZ is down, my cloud uh, pieces are all... Everything's down at this mm -hmm. point. What happens with my customers at that point? What are they seeing? Are we waiting for, like, DNS to time out? Are you instantly kind of taking it You over? need to... The customer needs to initiate the failover. Okay, okay? so there's not... There's no... Um, automated big red button by default. I'm sure you could do some creative things, mm -hmm. you know, inside of your environment. But in that, <clears throat> you're, that's kind of a great segue to where I was getting to. Um, so if there is a smoking crater situation and I need to do a full failover, you know, my data center's gone completely, 
the service provider offers up this portal, this Cloud Connect portal, where they can log into here. And I, uh, so I can log in. Me. So yeah, so this is this would be at the service provider site. This is their site that you're logging into. Yeah. So that's not, they're not, they're, the VMs wouldn't be active, active, kind of running all the time. No. We're just backing up until we hit that button. Well, you're actually, you're actually replicating. So they're, they're over there, but they're in a powered off state. Yes. So really, all you need to do is turn them on. Okay. But the service provider is not going to give you access to vCenter to go power them on. Good. So Yeah, there's a couple uh, of different ways you can do it. You can utilize yeah. the Cloud Connect portal, or I can call my service provider and say, hey, initiate this failover plan now. Gotcha. Yeah. It's something to consider is that you always have full control as uh, a tenant at, with your client, but something a lot of people overlook is what if it is actually a disaster, you don't have your data center, or I know me personally, I had to evacuate Louisiana for hurricanes, and when you're on the road on I-10 for 24 hours, the luxury of being able to get on the internet is not there. Right. So uh, A, like Clint said, you could always call the provider and have them do it, but if you actually didn't have access to your vCenter, and maybe needed to access, access this website on your phone or some kind of mobile device, the idea is that you can control your destiny at the provider without having access to your prom. Okay. Yep. That makes sense? Yep. So whenever I log in here, if I had multiple failover plans, so the tenant creates these failover plans in their environment that has their virtual machines inside of it, and you can see that here as I... Move. So we have a dig digital run book kind of in the service provider already. At Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's, well, it's definitely aware. There's Ratmir. Yeah. So here, the, serv uh, the tenant can go through, add their service provider, utilize the, the credentials mm -hmm. that we created on the service provider side that they've given to the tenant, log in with my tenant account. You can see here, fully built-in credential manager, so you don't have to worry about giving anyone access to the passwords. Um, it establishes the connection out to the service provider. Now, this is whenever I'm adding him to my environment. And we can see here that Justin has carved up a, a terabyte worth of backup space for me, um, as well as the hardware plan that I've got set up as well. And he's got 20 gig worth of, and 8 gigahertz worth of memory and the three public IP addresses that he's allocated, right? Inside of my environment, I'm mapping uh, the network extension appliance to my <coughs> virtual switch inside of my infrastructure, and then I'm giving that an IP address as well, so we're not utilizing any type of DHCP. I'm just giving it a, a static um, IP. So here, in my lab, I've gone ahead and I have a fun little web service that I've gone ahead and stood up for you guys, right? It just so happens it's all about Tech Field Day. We're here at Cisco Live. <laughs> Got my web server running, and oh man, I've got a failure, right? So the first thing that, I've, that I'm gonna have to do is, um, well, first I'm gonna power off my virtual machine. So you can see here, inside of my environment, my latency, currently one millisecond. It's in my data center. <coughs> As I switch over to um, one of the other things that the network extension appliance also does is it acts as a proxy ARP, right? So it is going to be able to map those ping requests and the traffic from my on-prem data center out to my service provider. So we can see here what my MAC address is of my local virtual machine running in my data center, right? And then I'm going to power off my VM and simulate a failure. Yeah, so this is what we call a partial failover. Right. So, I, you know, I mentioned earlier there's some kind of networking, cool networking stuff that we do in terms of failover. I mean, full failover we all understand, right? Smoking crater powered on the service provider site. Easy. We got that. That's easy. But what if you just have a particular app or service because you just powered off your web server, right? Um, you need to bring it back online, but you can't bring it back online in your data center. You want to bring just that one or, or a few VMs up online in the service provider site. That's what we call a partial failover. With the same address space. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, and, and that's where that's where the network extension appliances come in because there's one at the, there's one at the tenant side and there's one at the service provider side, and then the cloud connect gateway kind of acts as an inter intermediary, and that's what he's doing right here. Right, and for a customer, they're hands off to that component of it, so they don't have to have the network skill set, no, no absolutely, deploy any of those other technologies to do that. So no. if they're a smaller customer mm -hmm. and they want that kind of ability, 
you can do that because you abstract all of that mm -hmm. with yes. your call gateway. Exactly. Right. That's a huge feature, like the L2 yeah. extension functionality. You know, everybody in this room knows we have uh, uh, all kinds of network vendors. Since we're at a Cisco show, we'll talk about OTV <laughs> and all that stuff. And, and you're right, a lot of customers that come to us uh, have small IT staff, and the idea that they can just bridge layer two over this without any kind of geekery involved is very uh, popular. Well, but I also have to have stuff generally at a data center. Even if I have OTV, I've got to be connected to another OTV device at a site where I have dedicated infrastructure. In this situation, there's I don't own anything at your premise. No. Yep. I'm just buying services from you. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And the, to, to mention that, to piggyback on that, is what's, what's very flexible at the solution is the NEA appliance or the network extension appliance is a feature that you can enable or you don't have to enable. So if I am that larger company that wants to be a Cisco geek and send all kinds of ASR routers over to me and ASAs over to me, we still, you still can leverage that with the solution. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's very flexible. And that's a per cloud provider sort of offering, right? Like for yeah, your and actually per order. tenant too. So right. like, you know, if we want to talk about Ethan some more, maybe he uses the NEA and then Doug's <laughs> a customer, a Cisco customer, and he sends me a Cisco router. We can support both models uh, globally. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. But not every not every provider can do that though, right? Right. So from yeah, a yeah, that yeah. was a question. Yeah, that you know, so ILAN does that, but not every service provider does. That's why, you know, when you're shopping to figure out, you know, find a service provider, those are important questions to ask if that's important to you. So <clears throat> what I've done here is we're going to demo and show you the, the partial failover. But one of the things that I wanted to explain to you is in during the full failover, right? So I select a, a set of virtual machines and I choose the order that I want those to be powered on, right? So I may make sure that my domain controller and my DNS and all those infrastructure specific components are, are powered on and ready to go first. Um, you can set delays in between. Um, if you set the delay for, say, for instance, zero, the tasks and VMs will be powered yeah. on simultaneously. Yeah. Right? So, th yeah, this is just your standard failover plan. You create it on-prem. Once it's created, if you're connected up through uh, Cloud Connect, then this will transfer up to the service provider. And this is what you see when you log into the service provider portal where, where it, you, know, you can click failover. It'll run that plan that you defined on-prem. So that's kind of the idea. You know, again, the smoking creative scenario, you can't log in to your Veeam infrastructure, to your virtual infrastructure. You have to go to your service provider. If you've already created that plan, it's up there, you hit go, failover, everything's good. Right. I think one other thing that's very useful to think about and note here is that when we're doing DR, obviously you want to be able to mimic your networking scheme at the DR provider. And you also don't want to have to do things like change host names in Windows right. or change domain names or DNS. I think the power of the solution is that you can build out your network. Maybe you have a three-tier network, you have a DB, an app, and a DMZ, whatever your network is. The idea that you can build this out and that the, that uh, transfers over to the, uh, the cloud provider is very, very powerful. Because you don't want to have to deal with that kind of stuff, or, or you may not be able to deal yeah. with that kind of stuff if the, <laughs> the event comes. So if you do single VM failover, you have it in the cloud provider, you're, you're actively running on that, that's your, now your production VM. Yep. Mm -hmm. You get whatever resources back in your on-prem data center and you, you want to bring it back, how do you right. do that? You know, so there's the change. option. Yeah, well, I'll show you that here just in one second, but there's the option to basically undo any changes that have been made inside of that virtual machine, or you can then replicate it back. Fail right. back. Fail back. Fail back. Yeah. Yeah. And that's non-disruptive, the fail back? I mean, everybody talks about well, failover. Right. We can fail over in five seconds. We make no promises about failback. Well, I mean, you, right. know, so, you, have, you have to understand from a failback perspective, what is just reverse replication, right? right? And unfortunately, things are going to be down. Things will be down. We can initiate a replication while it's running, but then we have to, at, at some point, stop it. You know, power it down to a final sync of the, of the remaining data. Right. Once that's done, then power it back up on the source. So yeah, but we're not talking a four-hour procedure. No, I mean, down. yeah, yeah, most, yeah more, more than likely not. In between. And the nice yeah. thing about failback, <laughs> and I, I always talk about the a failover, you never plan. I mean, you, you never say we're going to fail over at three p.m. Right? <laughs> you don't. You don't do that. It just happens. You have to do it. But a fail back, okay. Now we're going to get. We're going to bring things back online. Yeah. You do that in a more of a controlled procedure right. because okay. We've got our environment back up and running. I think we're good. Now let's do a fail back, and maybe you only do one or two at a time. But a planned 30-minute outage is fine. Yeah, yeah, it's easy yeah where it's we planned. have some some methodologies of the past have said you know failing over is in seconds, but the fail back, you know, there's hours of outage <laughs> while you're dealing with whatever you're dealing with. So yeah, yeah. So that's good that it can do that. Yeah. Right. So now I'm going to go through and um, show you guys how to do an individual virtual machine failover. So what I've done there is right click 
on my VM and I go to failover now. And then you can see here that I have the different restore points that are available outside in my iLAN data center. So these would be replica restore points that I could go back to. Um, in this case here, I'm gonna go to the most recent one. Um, if I wanted to go back to an individual point in time, maybe I had some corruption in a VM. Maybe say, for instance, I had, you know, like say a crypto locker, right? And I actually need to, you know, go back to a different restore point where I know the, v the data inside of my virtual machine is good. Um, for control reasons here, we give you the option to give it a, a reason, right? Maybe I have a change control number perhaps or an incident number that I'm in response to. Um, so now what this is gonna go ahead and do is it's gonna contact the service provider side. It's gonna stand up that network extension appliance and it's essentially gonna create that open, VN, uh, open VPN tunnel to my on-prem network extension appliance, okay? So here in a few short seconds, um, once it gets processes and gets that network extension appliance stood up at my service provider side, the on-prem network extension appliance will power on and my VM, you'll see it'll be responsive here just in a, in a few short seconds. Um, yeah, we used uh, OpenVPN during the during the failover for, for the individual virtual machines. Right. Um, between the between the you know, on-prem and, and the service provider, so that way you know we get that that connectivity. <clears throat> right. So here, whenever it says processing server side of partial failover, it's obviously it's creating a client server connection, right? The the VPN server being in the service provider data center, that's the network extension appliance that's dedicated to that tenant and then the, the, the client side being my tenant in my own data center here that I'm running as. Um, and now we can see that this virtual machine is uh, going to be up here just in a... And this gateway is built into the Veeam server. There's no extra... We don't need an extra service server to do that? It, it's a Linux VM. It's a Linux right. VM, yeah. Yep. And it, it gets it deployed. Yep. Yeah. It gets deployed as the, the, the tenant... Or excuse me, the service provider and the tenant communicate with each other to create the hardware failover plans. So not, the, not on the service provider side. I'm saying on the customer side, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's built all into, automated. It's all built into the Veeam server. There's yep. no extra servers to do this. Correct. Yeah, so when, cool. when, you set up, when you get set up to a cloud provider, a small OVA gets put into your vCenter. You give it a, you either use DHCP or a static address. Okay. And what happens is when we as a provider deploy a NEA or network extension appliance for you, it gets a public IP on our side. You don't need to know all those things because when you connect, that connection is made uh, behind the scenes in the software. So it pushes it down to your NEA. It says, hey, when you need to do a failover, go reach this public IP. Both are set up, the VPN forms, and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to know or deal with all these, uh, all these things yourself. Yeah, so here, my VM inside of my service provider is up and running, okay? And we know this by now, before my latency was one millisecond because it was running locally. Now my latency is up to, you know, 39, 40 milliseconds. And then we can also see here that the proxy ARP between the two network extension appliances that's essentially doing that layer two over layer three traffic routing, right? The MAC addresses are going to be completely different um, from my virtual machine as well. And then my website that once was once was unavailable is now available just as if it was another you know running inside of my local data center yeah. is there any way to use the same mac if you want to so um no but since it's a new object within virtual center on my service provider side of the fence it's going to be a whole new machine id it's a new virtual machine can you do some kind of gratuitous arp on the local side so you don't have an extended outage due to you know arp, cache? ARP requests yeah um no i don't I don't think so. But yeah, what, what would be the exact use case for that type of stuff? You're just talking about ARP, oh, like an I'm ARP. I was thinking if a client device, let's say the ARP cache doesn't time out for five minutes, so you fail yeah. it over, it's already up in the cloud, it's still looking for did, a certain... Well, did the MAC address change or not? It does. The MAC address change on the segment, uh, the, the way the Linux appliance does it, it's listening for that MAC address and brokering that connection or passing that connection to the cloud mm -hmm. provider. So when the VM comes up at the cloud provider, obviously it's a different MAC address, but that MAC address isn't, doesn't, doesn't appear in your L2 segment on-prem. So the, the MAC changes act. in the VM, Correct. but it doesn't change on site. Yeah. Right. That's Correct. right. Yeah. So okay. when you so proxy, so that proxy yeah. Arc, yeah, that yeah. problem wouldn't happen then. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, it's the and same that's local Linux MAC. Yeah. I had the same prem is dealing, doing yeah. for you. That's okay. cool. Yeah. And, and Luca, we have a bunch of uh, slides that Luca, the Loca put together. Um, we thought the demo would be better, but we can provide you guys with the slides. It has a lot of the technical detail on how this all works, yeah. with little diagrams and things like that, too. Yeah, so. I mean, I, I figured that you guys would be more interested in um, seeing demo as opposed to, you know, 
fun networking diagrams that look like this that explain you know which ports are spe you know speaking with <laughs> each one. And it, I, I mean, there's more value in demo as opposed to death by PowerPoint, yeah. especially for you guys. Uh, do we have the option of for public IP addressing? Yes, for a full failover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So when the service provider has, if you recall in the beginning, I, I created that pool of public IP addresses on the service provider side of the fence, and then the service provider can allocate those public IP addresses that they have in their pool to a tenant. And then okay. whenever the tenant creates their hardware failover plan, they can say, for instance, map port 443 externally to 3389 for well, remote Would that be desktop. the service provider's IP address, or would we be able to do like some BGP stuff to where we share the address space? Or? So that's where the, the value add stuff comes in, right? So okay. the, and the base NEA functionality is if we allocated you 10 public IP addresses, obviously that would be something on our end. And to Clint's point, you could do things like do NAT mappings, SNAP mappings, DNAT mappings to say, hey, port 443, when it fails over, does this. Now, if you're a more advanced user and you want to do things like BGP peering, again, I'm, since, we'll, since we're at a Cisco conference, we'll talk about Cisco stuff, but a lot of our customers use uh, the Cisco CSRV, which is a virtualized appliance of the CSR. So you get iOS XE um, functionality, you can do BGP, and if you're inclined to do that, you can easily do that in our cloud. You, you probably wouldn't use the NEA appliance at that point. Okay. And sometimes customers rely on us to set that kind of things up for them as a, as a more complex use case. Gotcha. But it's definitely available, yeah. So if you had your own slash 24 with Aaron or something, and you wanted to advertise them out of two data centers, you do BGP failover, it would definitely work. So do you guys do some kind of fix up to the VM after it comes up? So if we're changing, I guess the IP is staying, but the Mac is gonna change. Windows doesn't always like that. Well, that, that, that's, that's something we've dealt with for a long time in, in terms of replication. Right. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it, you know, in, in general, things work really, really well. But if there's, you know, if you've, if you've got things that are hard coded or hard mapped, you know, because sometimes it'll come up and it'll say, hey, if there's a new network interface and then, you know, it'll go through and add that. Um, but that's why it's always important to test. Right. And yeah. one of the, you know, one of the other aspects of this is, you know, you can do a test failover. Um, in, into the service provider site to see, hey, is everything going to work, right? Yeah. You don't want to just yeah. put everything over there and then hope that someday when you push the button, it's all going to work. You want to. So that's a good question. Yeah. Can you do a, a fail, sort of failover test in a bubble where yes. it has connectivity only to itself, and then I can somehow get in there and see what's happening? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yep. Really. Okay. Yeah. That's part of what I, I mentioned earlier. Our virtual lab technology. Right. Um, it, it's not so much on the Cloud Connect side because you know, it's more on the service, but. The idea is creating these bubbles so that you can do testing, whether it's booting a backup, a VM up from a backup inside that bubble, or doing it from a replica or a storage snapshot. And I think we've got about two minutes left. Yep. So one of the last things that I wanted to wrap up with here is kind of the reporting. That's very important for a service provider. You know, how do I know how much space, how much capacity, what's my tenant usage look like? We've got an entire report set through a tool that we have called Veeam One that allows the service provider to do this automated reporting and type of, um, so that they can do billing and charge back to their customers so they can come in here, you know, run the, 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 the fun Cloud Connect reports that we've got here so a, a service provider can see, you know, how many tenants do I have, what's their quota look like, what's their usage, um, how many virtual machines, how many restore points do I have out in my tenant, or excuse me, out in my cloud repository per tenant. Um, that is available through the, the second report here that I'm going to show you guys, which is the Cloud Connect user, right? So we can see, you know, quotas per tenant. I can see how much space is being utilized, how many users are active. Um, so this is great information to have from a service provider's perspective, not only for, you know, proactive billing and things, but also for if I want to look long term and start doing some sort of capacity planning and capacity management amongst my virtualized environment. And it's extremely important for on-prem customers to go through these activities, but it's also very important for a service provider. That way they can you know, have trending analysis and historical information based on what their tenant's usage looks like. Um, so that's definitely an offering that we have for our service providers as well. And um, backup and replication is a standalone product. If you get backup and replication with the monitoring tool, it's called the availability suite and you get all this functionality together and the service provider can have all these offerings for their customers. So if you run into an issue with your service provider where it's not working out, can customers call you and you work with the service provider to help iron out those particular difficulties? What's not working out, like a support issue what, or? I mean, say, say, say failover's not working the way that you want and they can't seem to resolve the issue. Yeah. Do you provide that support to escalate and work with them? Yeah, 
Yeah. You know, yeah. And yeah, yeah. So we have, you know, from a support perspective, you know, either the service provider or the customer can contact us and, and we'll work through to make sure that, you know, every kind of get, get everything ironed out from a, from the support perspective. So we don't just leave our customers out there say, hey, it's between you and the service provider, right? Right. If it's, if it's a product issue or some sort of configuration, you know, we, we, we work with them to, to, to make sure it gets resolved. Yeah, and as a as a provider too, we have to keep certain level of uh, VMware's. I'm sorry, Veeam certified engineers on staff as well, so we get a escalation yeah. into Veeam support when we need to all come together and work on those issues. Three, two, one. Yeah, we have an entire um, certification process. As, as Justin said, it's the VMCE or the Veeam certified engineer, um, and one of the benefits that a Veeam certified engineer gets is direct line access to layer uh, level two support instantaneously. Layer two support. I like yeah. Layer two yeah. support. We're talking about network. Partial so. failover. I want to do a partial failover to the support organization. Yeah. Okay. So I